Go, go back to Hebrews 11, verse 39. And we'll just kind of set a little groundwork. What were we doing in Hebrews 11? What was the author giving to us in Hebrews 11? Hebrews 11, 39 is where we want to be. Hebrews 11. But just 39. tell me what that chapter was about. By faith. By faith. By faith what? Big long list of folks, right? All kinds of different. We're doing something. People yeah. We're doing something. Long list of people who, by faith, did something. But his point is not just to give us a rundown of heroes of the Old Testament. His point is the same as it has been through the whole document. What's the main theme of Hebrews? Jesus is better. Right? So since we've had this entire chapter of you know, by faith Moses, by faith Abraham, by faith, et cetera, et cetera. We need that punchline now. Okay, all these people did something by faith, but somehow Jesus is better. So the beginning of chapter 12 is going to finally make that comparison. But look at the last couple of verses of chapter 11. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised since God had planned something better for us so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Right? So our situation, and more particularly the situation of those first century Jewish Christians that he was writing to, was better than the situation of all those heroes of the faith that they adored so much. When you said Moses, they would applaud. When you said Abraham, they would be happy. And he says, yeah, but those guys didn't have what you have. So that introduces us to chapter 12, where he'll show us why Jesus is better even than that whole roll call of the faithful that we saw in chapter 11. So look at chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. Referring back to all of those folks that he mentioned in 11, he said, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race that is marked out for us. So 11 leads into the punchline in 12. All of them are happy about all this long list of heroes of the Old Testament. And he says, well, now imagine yourself uh, surrounded by all of those folks. Imagine yourself with Moses on your left and Abraham on your right. And what kind of life are you going to try to live? Their example is going to push you forward to living the right kind of life. They're a great example for us, right? So they're faithful, and they can encourage us to be faithful. But they're not the end of the discussion. They're not the most perfect thing. They're not the most uh, enviable position. They're not the most... Um, to be copied, we'll get to Jesus in a minute, but just imagine that you're surrounded by all of those people, this great cloud of witnesses. He says, just throw off everything that hinders us or stops us, the sin that easily entangles us, and run with patience the race that's marked out for us. Uh, the people that are mentioned in the uh, chapter 11, many of them were persecuted, some of them were isolated, and these first century Christians, these Hebrew Christians, are experiencing some of those same things. So just imagine yourself surrounded by those who went through it before, and they can handle it, they can do what needs to be done, so, so can you. If God helped them, God can help you. It's the stuff that great sermons are made of. Right? You go to the scriptures, you find how somebody was faithful in scripture, and you say, well, if they can do it, you can do it. So be like them. Uh, keep reading. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Right? So imagine that you're surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses but then fix your eyes on Jesus. He's the pioneer 
He's the perfecter of the faith. And then because he knew what was in front of him, he didn't stop when he had to go to the cross. So for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. What's the difference between Jesus by faith and all those Old Testament characters that we've already looked at by faith? They got finished with their lives and they never received the promise. Jesus is the promise. He gets finished with his life and sits down at the right hand of the Father. So Jesus changes everything. It's no longer this case where you, you live your whole life and you, you wonder and you hope and you, you're looking forward to something that never really belongs to you. Since Jesus came and lived and died and was raised from the dead, it's a different kind of uh, approach. So consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you won't grow weary and lose heart. Uh, if Jesus can do it, if Jesus went through it, you can too. In a little bit, he's going to make a very strong statement. You've not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. Right? If, you, if you haven't bled yet, then you know, why are you complaining? Jesus went all the way. He bled, he died, and was raised from the dead. Why would you stop short? So don't give up even though your persecution, even though your problems may be difficult. So um, he makes the usual comparison. Jesus is better. All those Old Testament people did by faith was commendable, but Jesus and his gift is better. Uh, he looked past the pain. So should they. So should we. And he endured the cross and didn't have to wait to do it. Once he got through the cross, he sat down at the right hand of the Father. So everything was, was linear, immediate, fast. And because of that, the power source is there. It's in place. The fact that Moses did well is interesting, but it doesn't change things for me. Jesus was faithful, and it changes everything for everybody who will accept his gift, accept his sacrifice. Um, verse 4 starts talking about a subject that... Um, it's, it's interesting the way that the Hebrew writer discusses it, and that's discipline. How we who are in Christ will have some kind of discipline in our lives. And it's difficult, and we're talking about Job on uh, Sunday nights, it's difficult sometimes to know when it's the hand of God disciplining, growing you up, and when it's bad things done by bad people to good people, and God may sweep in and help you with those problems, but He's not. it's not necessarily a point where he's saying, I want to discipline this person. I want to grow this person up. And it's, it's hard to know which is which. For the Hebrew writer, he's writing to a group of people that are being persecuted. The question is, was God the author of the persecution? The persecution was useful from time to time, but it's hard for me to imagine that God was the author of the problems they were having. I, I see him more as the author of the answer to the problems that they were having. So look at what the Hebrew writer says about it, how they should view their persecution, how they should view their problems. In your struggle against sin, you've not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son? It says, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline. Do not lose heart when he rebukes you. Because the Lord disciplines the ones that he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. Endure hardships as discipline. God is treating you as his children. What children are not disciplined by their father? If you're not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while, as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good, 
in order that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and your weak knees. Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather be healed. Now that's, it's difficult because it seems that the Hebrew writer is saying God was disciplining his people through the things they were suffering. Now, it may be that God was intervening and helping to grow them up through those things. But again, it's difficult for me to see God as the author of the persecution itself. I look at it a little bit this way, and this may not be a, a good example either. When I was in, I think, eighth grade, T.H. McDonald Middle School, I was in a, a history class where I was not doing my homework on a regular basis. And the coach that taught that class uh, told me, he said, next time you don't bring your homework, you're getting two swats. I think it was the next day that I came in without my homework. He took me down to the office, gave me two swats. And I remember those swats, well, I didn't get very many, but I remember those because he was left-handed and I had to move around to the other side of the, the desk to get my swats. As soon as he finished administering the swats, we came out of the back office and my mother was standing at the, the uh, uh, I want to say bar, standing at the at the desk, at the counter. Counter is a good word. Standing at the counter, and Coach Fortenberry started backpedaling. Now, Mrs. Tyree, Jay's a good young man, and uh, you know, I'm just trying to help him remember to do his work. Blah 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 blah. blah. And my mother says, "What are you talking about?" And he says, "Well, I thought they called you and told you that Jay was getting swats." And she said, "No, Jay left his lunch at home, and I brought it up here to him." And we'll take care of this when he gets home. So there were more swats waiting on me when I got back to the house. But it was something good for me. My mother didn't institute it, but she agreed with it. She allowed it. She let it be used to grow me up. Maybe that's similar to what was going on in the life of these Hebrew Christians. They were being persecuted. And maybe they were asking God, God, why aren't you allowing us to be set free from this? Why aren't you intervening? And maybe the answer is discipline. You're being grown up. Uh, James says, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. The trying of your faith produces patience. Some things are good for us, even though they're not enjoyable. So this group of people is being grown up by the things that they're suffering. Um, there is a list here of ways that God's discipline is similar to an earthly father's discipline. And it wasn't until I was up in ministry and started counseling that I realized that not everybody had a dad like I did. Right? That we all have parents that were, were similar but different and that some of them struggled more with being parents, and some of them just seemed like being a parent came naturally, and some of them were good disciplinarians, and some of them weren't. And, and so, But in general, some of these things that the Hebrew writer lists out, I think, are interesting. Um, he starts out with, the reason that a father disciplines his child is because he loves them. Right? The reason for discipline is to help with a better outcome for the kid. So if I don't love you, then I don't discipline you. If I don't care about you, I don't try to make you better. I just leave you to your own devices and let you go. Uh, the second thing is it's common and expected. All fathers discipline their children. Again, once I started in counseling, I realized that that statement's not always as true for some folks as it is for others. There are some that avoid discipline. There are some that over-discipline and really harm children because of whatever problem is going on in their own life. But it's common. Fathers, parents, discipline their children. Uh, it's a sign of a legitimate blood relationship. Did you notice that little statement? He says, if you're not disciplined, then you're not legitimate. The King James actually uses the word, we 
we don't like the word anymore, not in our culture, but illegitimate. Right? Remember we used to refer to kids as illegitimate? I, I hate that word, referring to children. But the Hebrew writer wants us to know that if it's a real relationship, if it's a legitimate relationship between father and child, that the discipline will be there. If the father doesn't care about you and you're not really, if you don't really belong to that father, why would he take his time? Why would he care? Uh, there was a time in our culture when the next door neighbor might discipline you. I think we've been litigated out of that. We're kind of afraid to intervene, uh, getting involved in somebody else's kids raising. But a lot of legitimate blood-related parents have backed away from discipline. And because of that, it's 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 difficult. I call them the OPC, other people's children. And for a long time, I thought I could fix OPC. I could fix other people's children. Uh, as, as a teacher, you've got them probably more hours than they're really involved with their parents at home. But still, you've got a classroom full and you can make suggestions and encouragements, but you can't fix them because they're going to go back home. And then you get them to the end of the school year, they're going to be at home over the summer. Whatever gains you've made may be lost. There are some educators that do a great deal of good in that area, but they don't belong to you. They belong to someone else. Uh, then he moves on and says, earthly fathers do the best they can. Right? They discipline as seems fit at the time. And I know that looking back over raising our daughter, there are things that I did to discipline her and ways that I thought were the right way to go at the time. And I look back and you know, blew the assignment. There are times that I thought I wasn't doing a very good job when I was doing a lot better than I thought. But it's, we just fumble through it, don't we? We, just, we do the best that we can with what little bit of expertise we might have. But look over at Matthew chapter 7. This passage immediately came to mind. Chapter 7, verse 7. It's a very uh, well-known passage, but not we don't necessarily think of it about discipline. It says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. Everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven gives, give good gifts to those who ask him? So he compares, you know, if you know how to parent, if you're interested in the, what's best for your children, how much more is your father in heaven going to be able to do the same? So the Hebrew writer would say, you may not understand the discipline, you may not appreciate the discipline, but accept the discipline because God is helping you to grow. I went down through, I, I don't like the word evil in this passage, so I tried to find something where it didn't say, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children. The best I could come up with is the common English version, which says, as bad as you are, you still know how to give good gifts to your children. So that doesn't help us a whole lot. Uh, but the desired outcome is righteousness and peace. God is trying to raise us up so that we can inherit that uh, gift of righteousness and peace. Um, now, look at verse 12 again. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and your weak knees, Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather be healed. And I think he's just referring to folks that are so beat up with being Christians that they're kind of hobbling back into Judaism and saying, I'll just hide over here for a while and I won't let myself be known as a Christian. And he says, you know, heal those knees, 
you know, gird up your loins, get back in the fight. Don't let yourself give in and give up. So, uh, again, it's the the punchline to Hebrews 11 is Hebrews 12. Look at all these amazing people, this great cloud of witnesses. But when you when you've noticed them, look past them and see that Jesus is the perfect example of faith. And his perfect example of faith tells us that the Father disciplined him and the Father is going to discipline us and it's all for our good. It helps us grow. Any thoughts about any of that? I look over my shoulder. Yep, 22 minutes. Just the way it works. No questions? All right, we'll see you guys later.